Okay, don't rock us again. Take one million. <laughs> Hi everyone, and thank you for watching my talk. And thanks DEFCON for inviting me and not giving up on this year con. This is the first time I speak on DEFCON and I could really use a welcome ROM shot. But since I'm not in Vegas, well, uh, I think I'm gonna save it for another time. This talk will present my recent research on Rockus Wireless. Rockus is a wireless solution company owned by Comscope. I've come to realize that Rockus is pretty popular in the States. They even uh, partnered with Black Hat for conference Wi-Fi solution. Actually, this is how I first um, noticed them. In the last year, I've been doing vulnerability research on Rockus access point. And so far, I managed to found several critical vulnerabilities in many of these devices. My previous research was introduced in the recent CCC convention, back when traveling places was a real thing. But before I begin, I would like to go over the obligatory who am I part. So my name is Gal Zrohr. I'm a research team leader at Aleph Research by HCL AppScan. I'm recording this talk from our lovely office in Herzliya, Israel. And I've been uh, doing reversing for more than a decade. I try to focus on offensive embedded devices research. All right, um, I would like to begin with a quick recap. In my previous research, I demonstrated three ways to run code on Roku's unleashed and zone director devices. All vulnerability were found on the device web interface. My first RCE was credential leakage with SSL, uh, SSH jailbreak. My second RCE was unauthenticated stack buffer overflow. And the last RCE was command injection vulnerability, which was reachable without authentication by writing a new page. In this talk, same as uh, in my previous one, I will be using Rockus R510 Unleashed. Rockus has an Unleashed version for every access point they provide. Unleashed access points uh, don't rely on Wi-Fi controllers. Um, well, all access points in the list you can see here share the same vulnerable code base. And I also noticed that some vulnerabilities works on zone director product line, which is the Wi-Fi controllers. Okay, so what's new? Well, this research began right after I got Rockus patch for my first research. I noticed that they did not fix my vulnerability correctly, so I decided to try and re-enable it. Besides that, my first research was 100% based on device emulation. Now that I bought an actual device, I can try to see if I missed something uh, that I couldn't emulate. Well, but before I begin with the new vulnerabilities, I would like to talk about a new Jira script that I uh, used for this research. My previous research and this one was done relatively fast thanks to a Jira script I wrote that fetches function name from uh, log strings Rakus has left in their binaries. Here you can see some of them uh, from uh, one of the binaries. This script helped me rename function by parsing these log lines that contain the function name. For more information about the script and its uh, generic version, uh, please check my previous talk or our uh, GitHub. All in all, this script was super useful for binary, uh, uh, binary compiled with Rakus code, but not all binaries were like that. It's a common thing for embedded devices vendor to use open source project in their uh, devices. Rockus Web Server is a good example for that. Rockus added new functionality by adding uh, code to a popular web server called EmbedDis. 
Since embedded sources are public, I didn't really need to reverse the entire web server binary. It was easier for me just to review the source code. But what about the parts that Rokus added? I would like to be able to mark these parts in Jira, so I'll know I'll have to reverse them. So for this, I wrote an additional Jira script. My new script tries to extract as many function names as it can from the embed these sources. I use different methods to extract this information, things like string matching and uh, function call trace. But the thing that helped me the most were debugging functions that contain the exact C file name and line number in the embed these sources. Here we can see that for this unnamed function from the web server binary, we get that uh, this function appears in server.c file around the line number 138. So if we go to this uh, line in the embed these sources, we'll be able to extract many function names from the sources. This is the function in Jira after conversion. These are all function names that I was able to extract from the source code to Jira. Okay, so let's take this function call graph for example. This function uh, is called MA create web server and it's being uh, called from the main. And it also calls other functions. Well, on the right hand side, we can see that all of the function names I was able to fetch from uh, the sources by using the script I just introduced. On the bottom left hand side, we can see the function names I was able to fetch by using the script from my previous research, that the one that uses the uh, log strings. And as you can see, there are still unnamed function left, but still the majority of functions are now named. So this is an excellent example of how these two scripts help me retrieving, retrieve plenty of information and save me so much time and effort on reversing. I'm also in the progress of writing a generic version for uh, this script that, I, that won't rely on specific debug information. I will share all of my script in our Aleph Research GitHub account, so feel free to uh, check it out. And uh, while you're there, you can also check other tools that we uh, got there. All right, cool. So now we're ready for some exploits. This is my first RCE. In this attack, I found uh, another stack overflow um, that was reachable with unauthenticated web request. And I would like start to start with a demo. Well, this is clearly not a live demo, but I will still try to do it in a live demo style. So, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see how it goes. Um, okay, so for that, I need my um, demo screen and my listener screen. Okay, so this is uh, the terminal that I'm gonna listen uh, to, uh, to port 1337 and uh, my exploit will create reverse shell, reverse shell to this port. So let's just uh, start listening. And now, um, okay. And now uh, let's uh, have a look on my uh, stack uh, overflow. So uh, this is my overflow. Wait, let me open it in a, a different way. Okay, so this is my overflow as you can see here. Um, and uh, I am creating this uh, reverse shell by using uh, netcat. 
and let's just uh, go ahead and send this so I will be posting this uh, file to this uh, address and uh, okay hopefully everything will work okay connection refuse it's a uh, it's a good indication let's see what's going on with my listener okay so connection received looking good as you can see uh, I managed to run LS and my user is admin and this user is part of the root group yeah so this is it this is my uh, uh, demo okay before I get into the vulnerability I would like to do a quick recap on my previous talk this slide and the next one were actually taken from my previous talk but I'll go over them just to create the right context there are three important binaries in the web interface the first one is slash bin slash webs this is the actual embed this web server it handles HTTP request and executes handlers according to its configuration it then sends command through a UNIX domain socket to EMFD slash bin slash EMFD is an executable that contains the web interface logic it maps function from web pages to uh, their own function to its own function it then implements web interface commands such as uh, backup, network uh, configuration, uh, retrieve system information, and much more. And the last one is libemf. This library is used by EMFD for web authentication, input validation, and some uh, code execution. And now let's uh, uh, look at this in a diagram so webs listen to http slash https if it receives a jsa page request it uses egs handler to pass a function name to emfd emfd then checks if the function name is mapped and if so it calls the right function pointer eventually emfd runs some kind of shell commands for example, if config, IP tables, route, etc. Since the web server contains both embeddish code and Rockus code, I decided to mark Rockus function with an RKS prefix. Rockus has added a new function that registers new um, ESP functions. ESP uh, again is the handler that runs if the web server receive a JSP request so here we can see that 12 functions are being registered each function registration needs a function name string and a function pointer now let's understand how we can reach this function with an HTTP request okay so for example when sending an HTTP request to slash admin slash web page slash Wi-Fi network slash WLAN sys confirm dot JSP please remember this page because it's a very long one um, the web server invokes an EGS handler on this page we can see that EGS script has a special tag right at the beginning right and uh, EGS function are being called from it webs maps every string it received to a function pointer and then runs it so here we can see that a function called escape j str is being called and another uh, wonderful function named s is also being called yeah s yeah <laughs> A great uh, a really great example of a shitty naming convention 
But the naming convention is not the only lousy thing about this function. When I reviewed these uh, added functions, I noticed that s, str, escape.js, and get cookie value are all using unsafe string copy. That means if I can find a web page that passes uh, user input to one of these function, I will be able to smash the web server uh, stuck. All right, so um, to search for an input that uh, leads to one of these functions, I decided to use the good old grab command. So I would like to search if there are any calls to one of these function with a non-static value. It also should not be uh, session related values because I might not be able to manipulate them. Let's say session cookie or something like that that is being uh, uh, generated uh, behind the scene. So here I used a regex that makes sure s don't get any value inside a double or single quote. I managed to found uh, two JSP pages. One was an error page which did not receive any user input, the second one. And the first one was uh, that, <laughs> that page with a very long name that I don't really want to say it again. So I just have a look on, the f on uh, that page. Okay, so um, we saw that S function receive a non-static value called content. And luckily, the content variable is set directly by a user parameter called content key. So I just needed to send the right request to wlan sys confirm dot jsp and that's it, I smashed the stack. As for exploitation, um, R510 uses both NX and ASLR. Um, to overcome uh, NX, I decided to use rope gadget. Actually, I used the same gadget um, as for my previous stack overflow. So this R2 gadget that runs system um, with a pointer to my payload. And in this case, I'm using uh, NC to create a reverse shell to my machine. As for ASLR, uh, same thing as my previous Stack Overflow, I can just brute force my way and overcome its 9 bit of randomness. All right. Yep. So before I continue with my second attack, I would like to share other vulnerabilities I found um, in this research that I think worth uh, mentioning. So I also found a cross-site scripting, a denial of service and information leakage that uh, may lead to another jailbreak. All of them were found in either the web server or EMFD. So uh, let's talk about the XSS. I discovered that I discovered this uh, cross-site scripting on my first research, and actually it was pretty straightforward. So every Ajax um, request to slash admin slash underscore WLA underscore CMD stat dot JSP has to contain an updater attribute. This attribute is simply reflected without any sanitation, as any validation, sorry. So uh, all I had to do is to send this payload and it just runs the, you know, the alert message. XSS in embedded devices is not that big of a deal, but I decided to report it anyway. All right, so um, let's go over the, over the denial of service. So um, while I was researching, I came across this request that simply crashed the server. Uh, I must say I did not invest too much time understanding this bug. Um, this is a web server related bug, of course, that caused either by an old version of Embedis or in uh, the code Rokus as added. 
All right, and now for the information leakage. So Rockus are considering the device serial number as sensitive information. In my previous research, I came across functions in Rockus CLI that rely on uh, the device serial number to get uh, to a busy box shell, to jailbreak. In this research, I noticed that upnp.jsp page is reachable without any uh, authentication. And this page gives away many useful information on the device that can be used for fingerprinting, let's say. But the best part is that I can get the device serial number and probably uh, jailbreak. Okay, um, so now is the time for my second RC. In this attack, I found a way to reuse the command injection vulnerability from my previous research. I then had to find a new way to bypass authentication by overriding admin credentials. So let's first understand how the command injection used to work in my previous research. So embed this, uh, sorry, um, EMFD execute code in a really messy way. EMFD sometimes uses libemf, other time calls the shell script sys underscore wrapper dot sh, and sometimes just run the command itself using libc. These are all the different functions that EMFD uses to execute shell commands. As you can see, there are many libc uh, system function calls. So I had to find a page that uses this system function without validation. And I found four functions that call uh, system and were vulnerable to command injection. And I will be showing the injection on the last one, which is CMD import AVP port. To reach uh, the vulnerable function, I had to send an AJAX request to slash admin slash cmdstat.jsp. This request used uh, use an EMFD command called import AVP port. And when EMFD received this request, it uses a function called cmd import AVP port. And this function just uses libc system function just like that, unsafely. Here you can see the functional decompiled code as it used to be in my previous research. So for my previous research, all I had to do is to pass a command injection in the upload file attribute. As, as you can see, it just executed without any validation. But the problem was that I had to be authenticated to reach this function. I had to use a valid cookie. Okay, so um, to fix this, Ruckus decided to use a function called isValidateInputString that's supposed to validate there are no injection characters in the upload file attribute. This is an ex external util function found in uh, libemf, and it's being used widely for input validation. So let's have a look at this uh, validation function. Here are all the forbidden characters for a given input. Well, at first, this validation seems pretty solid. However, some very important characters are missing from that list. So something I like to do when reviewing a validator is to create a set of all the printable non-alphanumeric characters that can pass this validator. And well, this is the moment I would ask you guys if you think uh, of a payload using this uh, set of characters. But thanks to coronavirus, I can't really do this shtick, so never mind. And anyway, after some try, uh, trial and error, I realize a shebang sign, which is pound followed by exclamation mark, is a valid input. 
so I can also use slash and, uh, and I can also use slash so I can use uh, shebang slash bin slash sh so this is good but not good enough I can't just append this payload to a uh, command run by system and well this is because shebang should be in a line of its own yeah right? it's usually uh, the header luckily I could also use a new line character yeah that is correct new line character as a parameter input is not being sanitized not in the web server nor EMF amazing right well shebang plus a new line it equals sweet sweet exploit well yeah okay so um, that was good news I can now replace my injection with shebang but there was but there was one thing to left to solve space characters is also uh, not a valid input so I simply replaced uh, them with uh, tab characters let's have a look on my new payload you can see that uh, for semicolon I uh, so I replaced semicolon with shebang plus a new line and spaces were replaced by tab and that's it this is how I uh, this is how I was able to reuse my command injection vulnerability the last thing uh, I had to do to complete this exploit is bypass authentication again okay so now I would like to explain how the admin credentials are stored in the device so system.xml is the device general configuration file it contains the admin credential as well as other important configuration here you can see that um, the admin element and its password is stored in the x password attribute while working on this exploit I noticed that Rakus has decided to use the most secure mechanism for storing sensitive passwords as you can see here so you might look at this uh, x password attribute and think that my password is 12345bcd but that's not the case my actual password is 12345abcd yes uh, yes yes Rokus are obfuscating the password by adding one to each character gosh gosh um, I just I just don't understand why won't they use uh, a simple hash function don't get it but never mind about that um, let's have a look at slash admin slash underscore uh, wla underscore conf dot jsp page we can see that this page calls for two functions in EMFD login without uh, access check and ajax.conf please keep in mind that we must pass the first function to get to ajax.conf which is the vulnerable function so um, without login access check expects an ajax request xml that contains either set conf action or do conf action the do uh, sorry uh, either set conf or uh, do cmd action the do cmd action in this case uh, was very limited and um, I decided to focus only on set conf so set conf action calls an uh, emfd function called check research credentials configuration parameter this function expects an admin XML element with the following attributes and please note that this function only validate the number of elements eight in this case and it only validate that the attributes uh, names matches the one we see here that means it won't check the value only that a certain request 
contains eight elements that matches with this name and it doesn't it doesn't check for any request permissions whatsoever okay so here we can see a valid ajax request with an admin element so this request has all the right attributes as you can see eight and then they are right and it can reach the vulnerable ajax conf function okay so let's move to ajax conf um, this is a very big function that does all sorts of things. One of them is uh, to use adapter set conf uh, to update different configuration file. In particular, it can update the main system uh, .xml configuration. As we saw, uh, without login access, forces me to use a specific XML element. But thankfully, this is the admin credentials XML element. So now let's understand how adapter set conf works and may be manipulated to write these credentials. So this is um, how adapter set conf function looks like. It receives the request um, component attribute and the Ajax and the Ajax request itself. I realize that if the comp if the component equals to system, then it can only update a specific XML element, which is not the admin uh, element. So I can't just uh, override the admin credentials with this request. However, if the component attribute is not equal to system, it uses a function called repo get cur child. And this function gets a component name and looks for an XML configuration file with that name. So that means I can access any XML file in the Erspider directory. Well, all of them except for the system XML because adapter set conf make sure it's excluded. Uh, but the credentials I want to override are in the system.xml, which sucks, right? So this is where slash come to our rescue. I noticed that if I add a slash at the beginning of the component attribute, it's no longer a system component. It's now a slash system component. So now I can pass uh, this system attribute check. And now get uh, a repo get curve child function. We look for the file slash system.xml, not system.xml, which is perfectly fine in POS6 since we can add as many slashes as we want. Okay, and that's about it. Adapter set conf has replaced the admin element in system.xml, which means I was able to override the admin credentials. Now I just need to chain these two vulnerabilities together. So first the override, here I'm overriding uh, the admin credentials with password 1234. Then um, run the command injection to pop a shell on the device. Well, since I consider myself a polite person, after getting a shell, I can obtain the original credentials by grabbing slash var slash run slash RPM key asterisk. Um, this was the file that I was able to leak in the first research. Uh, fortunately, Rokus insists on saving passwords as plain text. So uh, all he's left to do is to repeat the attack with the original credentials and avoid leaving uh, any footprint on the device. Cause we're not that rude, right? Okay. So this is uh, the time for my final demo. 
again I'll try to do it live-ish um, okay so for that I need my terminal again okay so first I would like to uh, override the credentials so let me just show you the um, the payload so this is the uh, this is the request and let's just you know change the password to uh, defcon why not and uh, 28 uh, safe mode awesome uh, okay yes and now I would like to um, post this XML so I'm just posting it to this uh, uh, admin um, WLA conf JSP and this is it I overrode the credentials now I'll have to uh, authenticate again to log in so um, let's go with um, what was it uh, defcon 28 uh, safe mode so this is just a, a standard um, login request and I get the CSRF token and a set cookie and now for my new um, Oh wait, I just want to show you guys my injection. So this is my new command injection where I use uh, shebang and then new line, telnet top top, and I'm going to open a port in 7331 on the device. Yes. Okay, uh, so this is it. Let me uh, just update the credentials real quick. This is this the first one, and that's the cookie. Okay, great. So um, yeah, just run it. Okay, that's it. And now uh, for the moment of truth, I'll uh, log in. Uh, I'll turn it to seven three three one, and. Uh, as you can see here I'm um, the root and this is it okay so uh, in conclusion today I demonstrated two pre-auth RCEs uh, the first one was pre-auth stack buffer overflow and the second was command injection with credentials overwrite um, I will also share my new and improved uh, Jira script that really helped me with this research. Rockus Networks was informed about these vulnerabilities. I requested six CVEs and they confirmed them. So in total, uh, these two research con uh, concluded in 17 CVEs that resulted in five different RCEs. Uh, and as I said in my previous talk, if there are any Rockus users who are watching this, you should stop what you're doing and check that you're running the latest firmware update. If not, you may be a victim to some, ser some very serious stuff. Okay, so that's it. Uh, these two research were tons of fun. I'm really glad that I helped Rockus making their equipment more secure. I will post a second blog post with all the specific at alephsecurity.com. Feel free to check our blog for my previous research and other amazing research done by our, by our group. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Stay safe and healthy. Woohoo!